Hello, it's Phil Croshaw again here, and in this episode of Passions, I'm going to be talking footy with Steve Wilkes. Enjoy. Hello and a very warm welcome to Passions and I'm absolutely delighted today to be having a footy conversation with the one and only Steve Wilkes from Northwich, Victoria. So Steve, a very warm welcome to Passions. Tell us what your passion is and what you do. Hi Phil, thank you for inviting me on. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my passion, as you've as touched on, is uh, football. Uh, especially non-league, I'm a non-league manager. I've been doing it for 23 years now, uh, just approaching 1,100 games. So, yeah, my passion is uh, football, especially non-league. So, did it come? Did that come from when you were like, you know, one year old, and you, you, you your mum and dad bought you some football boots, or was this something that developed through school years or late on in life? No, it's it's a family thing. My dad was a professional footballer. Um, he played for Accrington Stanley when they were professional and had a few games for Reading when he was in the army down south. So as soon as I could walk, probably I was kicking a football. Um, you know, so it's just it's come from there, yeah. And then did you, was there a point where you thought, OK, I enjoy playing. We've all played. I played at school and what have you. But was there a point where you thought, I want to make a living out of this? Or, you yeah, know, or was that a sudden? Yeah. Was that a sudden? You know, inspiration from God, as it were, or was no. it something that developed over a period of time? It it, it was always something that I mean, I think ninety nine point nine percent kids that like football would would dream of becoming a professional footballer. You know, I was I was one of the lucky ones that it actually happened to. Um, you know, so from an early age, um, my dad used to run uh, a Sunday league side that we played in. Um, I used to play for the Cubs team. Uh, the school teams um, come home at night, out on the field with the boys, with the lads uh, and girls as well, you know, playing football until it went dark and your mum would shout you in, you know. Um, so it was embedded into me. And you, I mean, I don't want to sound crass when I say it, but when you get that feeling that I'm, I'm, I'm OK at this, you know, um, I'd like to make a living out of this. Um, I was lucky. I was one of the lucky ones. I was, I was, a, I was only small, still am. <laughs> but I was only small at the time, um, so I was more of a, a, a winger stroke centre forward. Um, always been quick, always been quick. Not now, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> in the good old days, I was quick. I was, I think, as quick as at every football club I've been at. So that had a, a help in, and I could score goals. Um, and my lucky break came when I was playing in the school cup final for my school, St John Southworth in Preston. Um, we got to the final; it was on Deepdale. And we were playing a team called William, a school called William Temple. They had a certain Franz Carr. I don't know if you remember Franz Carr. Yes, I winger. do actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, Franny played for William Temple. So at the time, Franny was on Blackburn's books. Um, and all the um, the scouts from Preston, Blackburn, Burnley, Bolton, Wigan, all around the, the Lancashire area had come to watch Franny. Um, and at half time, we were winning 3 2, and I scored three. Um, so you know, people say you've got to be in that lucky place at the that right time. And on the Sunday, I remember mum and dad's phone was off the hook, you know, with clubs ringing and ringing and ringing. Um, Preston, you know, I, I, like I say, I've a, a, been a Preston fan, you know, since I was a kid. I was a ball boy at Preston. My dad used to work on the turnstiles at Preston, you know. So uh, Preston came in, but uh, Preston was struggling at the time. And the, the youth setup wasn't as good as Wigan Athletics. Um, so I ended up going to Wigan Athletic um, under uh, Harry McNally, who was the first team manager, and uh, a lovely bloke, fantastic bloke called Dave Crompton was the youth team manager. I went there, yeah. Right, and and was it um, was it was it always a passion of yours to to move into management as well, or, or what? How tell no. me the story, mate, of how that came about, how you ended up in management. Well, it's a funny one um, because I was playing for. I'd left 
obviously I had a car crash in um, 89 um, on the 1st of October 89 and I had a bad car crash that uh, broke my femur that ended up in hospital for 14 weeks with which stopped me playing at that level um, when I came back I, I dropped into non-league um, I went to Bamber Bridge which obviously is a local club and then I went on to play for Darwin and I've been at Darwin about four years under a good friend of mine called Ian McGarry who was the manager and I just sat at home in the summer of 97 and I got a phone call from the chair lady who was he, Ian's sister and she just said, uh, hey Steve, you're captain of the football club, uh, just letting you know uh, we've sacked our, our Ian, because he's a brother, and we want you to take over. And Phil, I, I, I had no intentions of going into football league, uh, into, sorry, into, into management uh, in non-league football. None whatsoever. And I turned it down straight away. I said, I said it's not for me. I said, because I, and people might not think it now, but when I was younger, I was a nervous lad and I couldn't stand up and I couldn't have done this 25 years ago. You know, I couldn't have stood up in front of people, especially, you know, lads that have, you know, has been captain of the football club. Um, and she said, well, give, I'll give you 48 hours and I'll ring you back on Monday because it was a Saturday. And, you know, we've just been talking about um, Big Sam off her. And obviously Sam was at Bolton at the time, um, and a good friend of mine, Roy Tunks, who I'd grown up with at uh, Wigan Athletic, um, he was assistant, I think, goalkeeper coach at Newcastle uh, under Graham Sooners. And I rang them both up and said, "Look, I've been offered this job." Um, and I remember Sam's words to me. Um, he said, "Wilksy, he said, do it, take it, don't turn the opportunity down, take it for six weeks. If you're still there after six weeks, you're enjoying it and you're doing the right thing." And that was 23 years ago, and like I say, nearly 1,100 games ago. So, and that's how it came about. But Phil, that that first season at Darwin, it was unbelievable. I would, I would do my team talk, right, and I've got a piece of paper, right, and I would be, I would read off a piece of paper what I was going to say. I would write out what I was going to say at home in the morning, and then I'd be in the dressing room with the players, and I'd be shaking like that. <laughs> <laughs> honestly. honestly. You know, and it was, it was Darwin because I didn't know money. I didn't get paid. The players didn't get paid. You know, um, the club was in, they had no money. So it was a fantastic grounding for me. Um, but yeah, I remember Sam saying to me, Wilkes, you do it for six weeks. If you don't fancy it after six weeks, mate, get out. But well, I'm still here and I'm loving every minute of it. Yeah, I mean, as we were saying before we came on air, uh, as people, some of people might know who are watching this, uh, I'm a uh, for my sins, I'm a big Bolton Wanderers fan. Now, obviously, recently I wouldn't have admitted to that, but now since we've won about six games on the trot, I'm bragging yeah, going about going quite it. well. Going well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I said. I say get some money on them for promotion. They're going up them, Bolton boys. Yeah, I tell yeah, you. yeah. It's it's been a long time coming. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, so obviously a big fan of Big Sam, and I was fortunate enough to interview him a few years ago for a video podcast we were doing. And one of the things that he said, which which has always stuck with me, is how much um, talent left the game because of a, of a poor mindset. Yeah. You know, uh, rather than, you know, really pure talent, but not yeah. got the necessary guts and drive and determination. Is that something you've seen in your career and, and looking at your players now at Northwich Victoria in terms of how far they can get and how much of it is mental and how much of it is physical, I suppose? I think I think you're spot on, absolutely spot on with, with the mental side of it, where I've seen so many players that are... I'll give you a prime example. When I first signed for Darwin in 93, I think it were 94, the manager was Ian McGarry. And he had a son called Ian McGarry. And he was on Blackburn's books and Kenny Dalgleish was the manager. And Kenny Dalgleish at the time had Sutton, Shearer, and he has gone on record as saying that Ian McGarry was the best player he has ever coached at any level. Yeah? Yeah, he never met it because... He went into the under a darker side, shall we say? You know, uh, yeah. and unfortunately, um, they gave him two or three chances. But and that happens a lot in non-league football, you know, because the financial rewards aren't there. You know, you're having to train two or three times a week. Sometimes you're out on Saturday all day, and you know, like I said, players have changed, Phil. Since I started doing this job twenty odd years ago, 
to what they are now a completely different i wish i had the time to write a book or the finances to write a book because i would you know and it would be a bestseller because of all the stories i could tell about how football has changed and how players have changed and ian mcgarry and you know we still speak to this day a fantastic bloke an old school manager you know um we had a lad called jonathan smith who he went on to have a good non-league career uh six foot four uh 17 year old center off making his debut for us at Darwin. And I remember um, I was stood on the uh, the bench, if you will, because I knew what was coming because Ian McGarry used to walk around punching everybody in the stomach before we went out. As the bell rang, he'd punch you in the stomach to get you up for it. And this young 17-year-old kid is stood there and he comes around and punches him in the stomach. And this 17-year-old lad goes for Ian McGarry, you know, and everyone's like, that's the norm, lad. I've never been punched, I've never been punched before. Next thing, McGarry goes, here, drink this. Little little shot of whiskey. Bang, 17-year-old kid going out at five to three. He's just been punched in the summer and having a shot of whiskey. If I did that to any of my players now, I'd be sacked within minutes because of the mentality of the players has completely changed. You can't touch any players now. You know, you can't... You know, we used to have great laughs with Ian McGarry and, you know, other managers I've played under, but... Nowadays, it's very, very difficult. Don't get me wrong. I have a great set of lads and we get on really, really well. But, you know, there's certain things you can do and you can't do now. And what the mentality of the players has, has completely changed. And I, I could name I could name dozens of... You mean, you look at Ravel Morrison, you know, at Manchester United, another talent. You know, Adele Tarat, who used to play at QPR. All these players, are, they could have been fantastic footballers. I watched, I watched the podcast the other day with Rio Ferdinand and... Um, Ravel Morrison, fantastic insight into how he felt. He couldn't get be bothered getting up in the morning. He was always late for training. He's playing for Manchester United and he couldn't be bothered getting to training on time. I don't get it. I just don't. I'd chop off my left arm to just sit and watch Man United at the minute. You know what I mean? So, but yeah, it's it's just, it's unfortunate, but uh, there's, there is a lot of players that do go under the, under the carpet, shall we say. You would you would tend to expect that players in the premiership have got that, what you might call prima donna perspective, you know, mm-hmm. don't yeah. push me, don't bully me, don't tell me what to do. Is there an element of that even lower down the leagues in terms of what you were saying about you, you can't do this and you can't do that? Can you be a little bit more, should we say, forceful? <laughs> Uh, I'm, yeah, not saying, I'm not talking about beating them up, but yeah, can, yeah. can you be a little bit more forceful lower down the league where you've not got the pre Madonna thing going I on? Think, I think yeah. nowadays it's tough, Phil. Years ago, like we just touched on, years ago you could. You know, like I say, Magoo used to, McGarry used to make us drink a little bit of whiskey or give us a punch in the stomach before he went, we went out just to get us going. Can't do that now. You know, players would be like, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? Why are you punching me? You know what I mean? Um, but... Uh, <laughs> It's unfortunate, you know, because I think that side of that is non-league football. You know, you have to have that element of listen. I, I've fallen out with players, and you know, uh, because I've said things that they don't like to hear. You know, um, I remember we got beat when I was managing Runco and Linux. Um, this was before um, Bill Brown did it at Hull. Um, I kept my players out on the pitch at, at half time. Uh, because we were poor in the first half. I couldn't get away with that now, you know, because the players would be like, no, we're going in, you know, and I, even though as, as the manager, you're saying to your players, you say that, no, I'm, I'm not I'm not sitting outside, everybody listening to me getting a rollick in, no, I'll, we'll go inside, you see. So, so it, it has changed a little bit. Um, for the better, I don't know, but uh, like I say, if I could write a book and add the finances, Phil, I'd, I'd definitely, definitely write a book. Well, one of the things we want um, we want to do with passions is uh, start to maybe develop some stories, passion stories right. that we'll transcribe and put into a book. So uh, I've got a strong suspicion I'll be on to asking you about that <laughs> Not a uh, problem. later in the year. <laughs> no problem. Now you've got a cup there, haven't you? You were showing me earlier. Uh, show us your cup. Got to show us your cup. And it's not the FA Cup, unfortunately. Unfortunately, is it? not. No. It's, okay. Uh... So this he's is, got this is a North, a Northwich champ. This on the terraces. He's got no hair, but we don't care. Stevie, Stevie Wilkes, love That's it. The one. Love it. 
obviously that could appear that could apply to me as well. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, I need to get the same the same one. Well, I'll get you a cup, but it won't say Stevie Wilkes. It'll say Bill Crawshaw. Yeah, quite right too. Okay, so um, well, wh- one of the things that we talk about a lot in our, in our, you know, a lot of what we do in our, what you might call our day job businesses is business development and business improvement support. Um, and part of that, it covers a lot of wide range of different things, obviously, but it's about improvement in business and, and individual improvement. And um, motivation is a key part of what we talk to our clients about because it it obviously has a massive impact. And it just struck me then when you were talking there about, you know, the guy's playing for Manchester United and yet he can't get out of bed, you know, and and you're like staggered. So yeah. I suppose two questions really in one, how important is motivation to get the, the, the players going? And what can you do? What do you do to drive that motivation and to get the best out of them? I'm, I'm massively into that kind of stuff. You know, um, I think um, one of my traits, shall we say, is, you know, with, with football managers, you've got all kinds of different managers. You know, some are very good coaches, some are very good uh, man management. Uh, I'd like to think my man management skills are why I'm still in the job. And why I've done, I'm not going to say not being successful, but why I'm, I've done okay at the job. You know what I mean? Um, I think, you know, when it's your birthday and you get 30 or 40 messages from ex-players wishing you happy birthday, it, it, it's, that's a pride thing for me, you know, because it must they must think, you know, I like Wilkshire, the gaffer's done all right. And I'll motivate my players. I mean, if, if you ask if one or two lads that have played for me that have gone on to become managers now, it's quite funny that they'll say that they take some of my traits into their team talks because on, on, a, on a normal match day, if we're kicking off at three o'clock, we'll meet at 1.30. I'll let the players have a 10 minute chat with each other. You know, then about 20 to two, we get serious and I'll start my team talk. My coach is always saying to me, yeah, I want the players out by five past two. So, I'm, you know, because my team talks, I'll try and make them humorous. I'll try and make him feel that he's the best player in the world. You know, we'll do something on the opposition. We'll do something that we didn't do well in the last game. But I'll try and make it so that the lads enjoy it, if you know what I mean. Uh, so as I'm going along, um, I will try and motivate the players to, I might say something derogatory against the the opposition that motivates my lads to think, oh yeah, I remember last time we played them, they beat us 1-0. They banged on our door at the end of the game, kicking our door in. You know, motivation. We're going to do that to them today, you know, and then the players will go out and, and do their stuff. I'll disappear for an hour. I don't, I don't go and watch them train. That's my coach's jobs. And then at quarter two, um, you know, 10 to, 10 to three, sorry, we'll come back in and I'll just go through. I'll go over to Joe, Joe Bloggs and Wishman is here. You know, you're the best right back in the league. You know, and you're playing against a good left wing today. Not a problem. You you know, and motivate them that way. So I think motivating your players is, is absolutely critical and crucial because if they see you just sat there like that all day, how are they going to get themselves up for the game? You know, and I'm sure if you if you speak to some of the league officials in the northwest counties um, and ask them if I'm motivated on the touchline, well, <laughs> I've been banned from uh, grounds for three or four games. Um, I don't know if you've uh, if, if Ian, or obviously our friend, told you about the story um, that ended up on BBC News. You know, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> tell us. <laughs> well, I got a, a two match uh, stadium ban when I was managing Parium for um, for giving the linesman a signal uh, that he didn't like. If shall we, if, if you understand what I'm saying, <laughs> so I got a two match ban. Um, it carried on into the following season. The first game of the following season, we was in the FA Cup against the uh, City of Liverpool at home. So I got myself a ladder. I put the ladder up against the uh, the wall outside the ground, climbed the ladder, and I watched the game on the ladder. I had my phone in one hand, and I was holding onto the ladder with the other hand, and I was conveying messages back to my staff that were in the dugout. Unfortunately, we got beat 2-1. And City Liverpool were a new team, that the breakaway team from Liverpool FC. But they brought about two or 300 fans, and obviously some had took pictures of me on this ladder, it went all over uh, Twitter, Facebook or whatever. Um, and I ended up getting a, an extra game banned by the FA because they said I'd actually watched the game and not missed it. 
So on the Monday, I get a phone call uh, from BBC News. Um, they said, we've seen this picture. Can we put it on the news tonight? And I'm like, Obviously, of course you can, yeah. So I'm there at half past six watching BBC News and a picture comes on of me on this ladder. And it was the worst picture you could feel. I was, my face must have been screwed up like Quasimodo because I was shouting at one of the players who was playing and it was broadcast all over the BBC. So, and I remember the conversation that the the people in the studio had said, "Oh, that's a fa- that's fan that's dedication for you. That that's fantastic." And at the time, Mourinho was United manager, and then the bloke said, "Do you think Mourinho and Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool would do what Steve Wilkes has done?" And I thought, "Well, I've made it now. I've been in the same sentence as Jurgen and Jose. I'm happy." But the funnier thing was on the I think it was the Wednesday. My phone rings again, and it was a Widell number, and I thought, "Ooh, um, do we answer this?" Do you? Anyway, I answered it, um, and it's is that Steve Wilkes? Yeah, yeah, it's such and such a hot air balloon company. I said, "Right," and they said, "We, we believe you've got an extra game ban for you." I said, "That's right, yeah." Well, why don't we pick you up Saturday? We'll fly you above the ground, and we'll hover over the ground, and you can watch the game from the hot air balloon. I hate flying, Phil. I'm not a big, big flyer. I, I'm gripped when I'm flying like that, you know, wherever I go. So I politely declined the offer to go up in this. He even said to me, we'll put your sponsor's name under the basket. I said, no, mate, it's not for me, I'm afraid. So, so yeah, and, and I think that comes, again, back down to passion. You know, um, I've got, sometimes I've got too much passion, uh, which is not, not a bad thing. You know, uh, sometimes it does get the better of me, shall we say. But I don't, I'll never want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. As, as a marketer, if I'd been there with you, and I, as a marketer uh, by trade, I'd have been basically begging you to get up in that flipping balloon. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, because I'd be thinking, oh, that's going, never mind, never mind uh, local rag BBC. That's going global, that one. But <laughs> well, you know what? The chairman at the time at Paddyham gave me a right rollicking. Um, for going up the ladder. He said that I was bringing the club into disrepute and giving it a bad name. And I said, how can how can, how can can I be giving it a bad name? We've just been mentioned in the same breath as Jurgen Klopp and Jose Mourinho. But I, I, think it's, I think it's, I absolutely think it's refreshing. And I think the majority of people love stories like that. In, in an age of health and safety madness to oh, a point, yeah. You know, and, yeah. and and PC and wokeness and all these kind of, you know, all these terms that we as older people shake our heads in disbelief what we see and hear. Because mm. um, I, I can just imagine that apart from the BBC, I can imagine your health and safety, your health and safety uh, person being at the bottom waiting to speak to you as well, kicking off because they've broken <laughs> God knows what laws and the health and safety handbook. <laughs> But it's funny because I nearly got knocked off the ladder twice with two of my lads with a terrible shooting. But they got fined. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's, I just think that's absolutely fantastic. And it does yeah. it does show that passion. And, um, yeah, it's yeah. an interesting one, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, we were talking before we came on air about some managers that seem to be less animated, I would perhaps use the term, yeah. Um, you know, some are just so animated and their passion just oozes out of them and they almost can't control it. And I suspect yeah. there's an element of that in you. But then yeah, there's other managers absolutely. that just will, you know, kind of don't say or do a lot. Sit back and look at the monitor. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and know. you know, and, and I think personally, I think I would prefer to play for a manager who was more animated and more communicative rather than Absolutely. somebody who's quieter yeah. but then each to their yeah. own i guess i mean even you know even in the, the strange times that we're living in now when we started back we only played seven league games last year and in in the dugout you're only allowed yourself your assistant and your physio the substitutes have to go and sit in the stand behind but we had to wear masks yeah and not a chance not a chance i'm you know i had it round my neck you know, and I'd, I'd be pulling it down and screaming and shouting and getting you all, giving the referee what for, the linesman what for, or the opposition what for. And then you put your mask back up and you stood there and I'm thinking, this is not me. You know, I ended up taking it off, so rightly or wrongly. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, we touched, like I say, you say before we came on here, we, we spoke about 
you know, I'm a big Man United fan and we spoke about Oli and my only complaint with Oli is that he sits in the stand with his legs crossed looking at his monitor and I'd rather him be on the touchline berating players when things aren't going right. Because, like you say, you know, it pains me to say it, Jurgen Klopp's one of the best around, um, you know, and his, he can't take his passion away. You know, he got laughed at. I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, um, Liverpool drew at home 2-2 to West Brom. And he took his players and they all stood hand in hand at the end of the game. They walked towards the cop and they all like bowed in front of the cop and everybody slaughtered him. I'm thinking, that's fantastic. That. <laughs> that's 20,000 people. All right. And you're all you're there with all your players in the middle of it. You know, bowing to your fans that have been singing, you know, we get 25 watching, never mind 20,000 in the cop. You know what I mean? But <laughs> I love stuff like that. Love it. You know, yeah. um, but I um, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's absolutely awesome. Okay. So we're recording this uh, at the <clears throat> just at the beginning of March 2021. Um, yeah. So it, I, I must ask you, obviously, about the pandemic. We kind of hear a, a fair bit about, you know, the bigger clubs. In fact, we always hear about the bigger clubs, don't we? Um, yeah. <clears throat> but what's it really been like at the lower levels of, of, um, of football in terms of the impact that this whole thing has had? Horrendous. Horrendous. You know, we, we um, last season, I think it was middle of March last year, probably coming up 12 months ago now, that our season got null and void. Um, so we didn't play again. Um, we came back training, uh, I think it was May, June, in groups of six. Um, the season kicked off in October. It should have kicked off in, uh, sorry, it kicked off in yeah, October. It should have kicked off in August. So we're two months behind. And then, you know, uh, seven games in, uh, it gets locked down for a month. And then I think it was the Wednesday before we should have started again. Uh, the next wave, the tears, the tears came in, and no, fan, at our level, you can't, we can't afford to play football matches with no fans. And you know, we only get two hundred and fifty on a good day. You know, so to play without fans, no, no T bar, no clubhouse, uh, it's just not feasible for clubs at our level. And I think we've we've been forgotten. You know, I think I think there's two teams in our leagues, not our division, in our league that have gone to the wall. Uh, FC Oswestry and I can't remember the other one who've just gone because you know they they, they can't survive. Us at Northwich are uh, we're in a, a unique situation where we're we're quite lucky if I'm being honest, Phil, because we share grounds with Witten Albion, um, so we don't have an electricity bill, a gas bill, a water rates bill. You know we don't have main to maintain the pitch or have to cut the pitch every two or whatever. You know so in that sense we've been all right, but. These clubs have been getting small grants from the FA. We can't get any because we don't have those bills, you see. So we've lost a lot of money on sportsmen's dinners. We've lost two sportsmen's dinner, you know, that make us a bit of money. Um, we've lost money on um, end of season do two end of season play with the year awards, which, you know, for a club like us, we usually make three, three, three and a half thousand pounds a night like that, which is massive to us. Lost all that. You've lost all your programme sales during the season. You've lost all your golden... I know it might sound trivial, £50 here, but you you rack that up, you know, and it's a lot of money and it's been tough. You know, it's been really tough. And obviously this week, um, was it last week, sorry, that they said that this season's been curtailed. Not null and void, it's been curtailed. Now, I had to look that up in the dictionary because I didn't know actually what it meant. And it's it shortened. So we're asking the question now, is the league to be shortened? But then you, two days later, you get a, a message from our league saying, you know, no, it, it's null and it's done and dusted. Um, we've asked to play a cup competition in the league, but they don't, the league don't want to know. So uh, we're trying to organise one ourselves. But it's been really, really tough. You know, I've not seen my players since the 4th of November. And, um, you know, and as, as we touched on earlier, I've been doing this 23 years and my life, my passion is football, you know. Uh, if I'm not at a game on a Monday, I'll be at a game on a Tuesday or training. I'll be at a game Wednesday. We train Thursdays. I'm on the phone all day Friday to the players, getting them ready for Saturday. I work Saturday mornings till dinner time at Royal Mail. And then I'm, I'm at football. And that's all gone. You know, um, you've got your WhatsApp group with your players that for the first 10 days after the, the season's finished, the banter's flying around. And then it just eases off and... 
you know, and it's been tough, you know, personally, um, to go from such a busy schedule. And don't get me wrong, I love it. No, I'm not complaining. It's, it's a busy schedule. To next to nothing, you know. I, I, I it's, it's like deja vu every day. Now I get up, I have a shower, I come to work, I go home, I walk in the house, the dogs run out for a, a whittle, they come back in, I lock the door, I go upstairs, put my PJs on, get on my bed, watch the television, have my tea, go to bed, and that's it. That's the day, you know. And you know, from when you're you're out up and about, you know, I love football. I, I, I you know, I, if I'm if I'm walking the dogs on a Sunday, there's a game on a park, I'll stop and watch it. 15 20 minutes. I've got an eye out if there's any good players playing, obviously, you know. But, uh, but yeah, I've really, really missing it. It's been tough for non league football clubs, especially at our level. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating actually because I've been doing a lot of these interviews over the last few months and interviewing all sorts of different people from different walks of life. And I never really anticipated it to a point, but it's just been fascinating. You're talking to passionate people who have had their passions curtailed, stopped, yeah. s taken completely from them. Uh, yeah. You know, I was doing, doing an interview with Ian Redmond, who's one of the top cons con conservation guys in the country, uh, gorillas and all that stuff. And, yeah. you know, he's not been able to go out where he spent most of his time, in his case, <laughs> in, wow. the, in, the, in the wild, not the wild jungle of football, but the wild jungle of, <laughs> of, of, of Africa. So, yeah, it, it is. And, and people from um, entertainment, I've sp spoke to a number of people in theatre, actors. Oh, they've been hit hard on here. You, you know, and it's quite remarkable. And when they talk about being unprecedented, I don't think there's any doubt it absolutely has been unprecedented. Oh, it's, been, it's, been it's been tough, mate. It really has been tough. And mm. obviously some people, you know, I, I'm one of the lucky ones in a way that, I come to work every day. You know, since since day one of this pandemic, I've been at work because I work for Royal Mail. So we've not had to stay at home. You know, I had a week off, I think it was two weeks ago. And by Tuesday, I'm, I'm, I have nothing to do. You can't go anywhere. I'm just watching television, you know. Um, so it, it has been hard. It has been hard, like I can say, for everybody, you know. And when you have that passion and you're a passionate person and that's just been yanked away from you and taken away from you and, your, your lifestyle changes, you know, it, it's been tough, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel, I hope. <laughs> there is, and I think that's fair. It's a fair comment. And, uh, you know, just right now, I think there's definitely the cavalry's coming over the hill. Uh, yeah. I think it'll be a bit strange for the next few months as people try and work out what yeah. they can do, what they can't do, what they're confident in doing. You, you've hit the nail on the head there, you know, yeah. because... You know, when you walk in a pub and you see a mate who you've not seen for ages, your first thing you do is, I a pal, you know, are they going to want you to do that? I'll still do it, you know, because that's me, you know. But, you know, we had a, a driver came the other week. Um, I hadn't seen him for about 12 years. He'd come to bring some mail in for me. And I had, like I said, and I, I went up and I went, hello, Ray. And he went, nobody's touched, <laughs> me, for eight, nobody's touched me for eight months. I'm like... Oh, okay, you know. So, but um, yeah, it's going to be strange, mate. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, think we'll, I think we'll be elbowing for the foreseeable. When, when do you? When? What's the word on the ground then about um, when football will come back? When? When do you think that we'll get crowds back in? Do you think there will be smaller crowds allowed first, yeah. and yeah, then I mean, it will build, or will it just be you know October one bam? No, I go. think. I think um, we've been told that grassroots football can commence on the 27th of March, but with no oh, fans. Right. With no fans. So that we can't we can't do we, we can train, you know, we can go training or whatever. Um, but we can't have fans in. Um, they're gonna look at that on the twelfth of April. Um, and then I think the further into I think it's the twenty not sure twenty seventh of May it might be that they're saying that ten thousand people can be allowed back into the stadium, and I think that's two days, or that I'm not sure of the date. The pr last Premier League game is on that Saturday, and they're saying from that Monday you can have ten thousand fans back in. So obviously, people is now the Premier League are saying, is it going to be an unfair advantage if, for example, Brighton are at home the last game of the season and they need a point to stay up? They've got ten thousand of their fans in, and West Brom are away at somewhere that they haven't got any, you know what I mean? So I would think they will say no fans till next season. Uh, the funny one is they're saying that come the 21st of June, when pubs and everything are open and we can have 
90,000 people back in stadiums the day after England played Czech Republic. So in the Euros at Wembley, so are they going to go from nothing to 90,000? I can't see that, can you? You, you can't, can't see it, can you? <laughs> no. And no, I think this obviously goes without saying the sooner fans are back in the stadium, it's better for everybody. But I think we're gonna have to have that approach of um easy, easy, if you know what I mean. Maybe at our level they, they allowed us to have three hundred in, which was fine because not many teams in our league got three hundred, you know. We did on a few occasions. But it was funny because after the end of last season was null and void, the start of this season, our crowds went up significantly because people had missed it. And they couldn't go and watch Premier League matches or Championship matches, so they came to watch non-league football, which was great for us, you know. So it's going to be it's going to be a funny one, um, but I think it will be like a, a staggered um, fans back in in the ground. I would think, Phil. I would think. Yeah, I, I would. I would suspect that would be the case. Right, Steve. Well, thanks ever so much for joining me. Uh, wow, that's all I can say on the matter. Um, I always try and take something away from every interview I do, and this is no exception. Um, you know, and as I say, I can't wait to hear some of those uh, those stories. Funnily enough, I've I've done a lot of these interviews, well, quite a few of these interviews now so far. And there's quite a few people I've interviewed who've been saying, I'm going to write a book, but the people I'm going to write about need to be dead before, before I tell the story. <laughs> well, yeah, there's one, one or two, yeah. There's one or two, yeah. Oh, I could tell you some stories from when I was a kid at Wigan and we went to Spain. We, we got promoted, we went to Spain and, oh, mate, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll definitely be back for those. I'll definitely be back for those. <laughs> well, thanks for joining me today, mate, and thanks for sharing your passion. You know, it absolutely exudes out of you. Um, no and uh, I'm really delighted and thanks for your time because I know time is precious and uh, thank you and I'm, hopefully I will speak to you again and maybe meet you one day you're not too far yes. you're, I'm in Manchester so you're not far you're, away from you're me. more than welcome to come to a Northwich Victoria game anytime as a guest my friend not a problem right I'll take you up on that I'll definitely take you Brilliant. up on that okay mate, thanks very really much really enjoyed it really enjoyed it thanks for cheers, cheers mate. Bye 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 bye, -bye.